Welcome, everyone. I think most people have made it into the meeting now from the waiting room. Um, my name is Raphael Fazel. I'm the executive director of the Cambridge Centre for Animal Rights Law, and I'm pleased to be able to um, welcome you to this first event in the Easter term series of the Talking Animals Law and Philosophy lecture program. Um, for those of you who are joining for the first time, I'm going to say a few words about how the Talking Animal series works before we um, kick off with the, the talk itself. Um, the presentation that we'll be hearing will last for about 30 to 45 minutes, and we'll then move to a sort of open floor discussion with you. Uh, everyone's warmly invited to participate in that discussion. I usually encourage people to ask their questions directly by using the raise hand function. Um, you can find that under the reactions button on the bottom of your Zoom app. Uh, but you're also free to use the chat if that's easier for you and if you'd like to come in and ask a ask a question or make a comment um i will um record the talk part of this event but we'll uh, turn off the recording for the discussion uh, until the discussion i will have all microphones muted um as indicated we are recording this and you can find the recording on our website in a few days time if you'd like to watch it again or send the link to a friend. Great, I think that's all as far as sort of um, housekeeping is concerned. And it is now my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today. And that's Laurie Marino. Uh, Laurie is a neuroscientist and an expert in animal behavior, intelligence and self-awareness. And she was on the faculty of Emory University for 20 years. Uh, Laurie is also the founder and the president of the Whale Sanctuary Project and the executive director of the Kimala Center for Scholarship-Based Animal Advocacy. Laurie is currently an adjunct professor of animal studies at New York University, where I understand she's just wrapping up the term. Laurie's scientific work focuses on the evolution of the brain and intelligence in dolphins and whales, as well as in primates and farmed animals. She's also focusing on the effects of captivity on wildlife in her work. Uh, Laurie has written over 140 peer-reviewed scientific papers, books, as well as magazine articles. Laurie, as some of you may know, has also worked at the intersection of science and animal law and policy. She's been an expert witness and advisor for several, several legal efforts for animal rights and protection, including for the Non-Human Rights Project, and the Canadian Senate Bill S-203. Together with Kathy Hessler, she's the co-founder of the Animal Law and Science Program at George Washington University. We're delighted that Laurie is joining us today for a talk on the synergism of animal law and science. Uh, Laurie, the floor is yours. Thanks so much for being with us today. Hi. Thank you, Raphael, for that uh, lovely introduction. And uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. And thank you for the invitation. I see some folks that I know, which is great. Uh, Don Broom and Sean and a bunch of people. So it's uh, terrific. Um, what I'm going to do is share my screen and, and uh, share PowerPoint with you and then uh, make sure that we have plenty of time for for discussion. So let's see. Can you see that? Yes. Okay, so I want to okay, there we go. That's the beginning. So everyone can see the beginning slide. Okay, so again, thank you again, Raphael, and uh, thank you to the Cambridge Center for Animal Rights Law. This is a real pleasure. Uh, Raphael and I met not too long ago at Yale, and I was giving a talk there, and uh, he is the co-author with, with Sean Butler of, of a fantastic textbook on animal rights, so I just wanted to put in a plug for that <laughs> there. Um, so. What I want to talk about today is uh, an area that involves 
uh, the combination or the synergy between two fields, science and animal law. So we know that, you know, for the past few decades, there's more and more scientific research coming in about the cognitive abilities in other animals. And this has really driven a growing realization that they possess a lot of characteristics and capacities that are ethically and morally relevant. Uh, things like self-awareness, planning, uh, insight, emotion, sophisticated memory capacities. So the science is growing and repeatedly telling us that members of other species have morally relevant characteristics. And as we know, law sometimes and often tracks ethics and morals. So it is also the case that animal law has been on a tremendously rapid rise for the past few years. And when you put those together, that when you really think about it, the task of, of promoting and working for the welfare and the rights, protection, conservation of other animals depends upon being able to reflect who they are. There's a vast array of species on this planet that we share the planet with. And in order to really advocate for them in any arena, you, you have to know who they are. Um, and that information comes mainly from the science, from the scientific literature. And advocates for animals of all kinds need to be able to utilize that science in the most effective way. And, and this is true for practitioners of animal law. And a number of uh, practitioners of animal law and legal theorists have recognized the importance of science in animal law. Marion Sullivan at Columbia says science is incredibly important to animal law. Cognitive ethology is really what animal lawyers rely on in arguing that conditions for animals in any area should be improved. Um, Katie Sykes in, in, in a paper wrote, increasing scientific understanding of other animals plays an important role in the, in the wider discourse about animal welfare and rights. New insights from scientific research challenge our preconceived notions about other animals, and they add weight and nuance to those intuitions. So science makes for more robust and better informed legal discourse about animals. Alexander Gillespie recently wrote debates about non-anthropocentric values, in other words, animal values and the relationship between our species and other species, which was once exclusively in the province of philosophy, now has moved to uh, international law and policy. And finally, um, right here in, in, in this country, the Non-Human Rights Project, um, bases all of its cases on law and, and they write, uh, we closely follow the science of who non-human animals are because science creates an unshakable foundation for the arguments we make in courts and legislatures. So I want to turn to now um, a specific example of how science and law have come together in my experiences with uh, being an expert witness for um, Canadian Bill S203. It's a really interesting story. Um, this bill is called Ending the Captivity of Whales and Dolphins Act, and it passed in the summer of 2019. It began sponsored in 2015 by Senator Wilford Moore, and it amends the criminal code and other regulations in order to ban 
keeping, trading, and breeding cetaceans for entertainment purposes and violations uh, uh, face fi uh, fines of up to 200,000. And there are of course exceptions for rescues and rehab and the best interest of the animals like sanctuary. Um, now this was, this was a fascinating journey because it took over four years of fighting and up and down and back and forth in every which way um, to get this bill passed. It involved 40 witnesses and many of them were scientists. Um, and there were 17 committee hearings. And um, uh, it's, I was at one of the committee hearings um, along with a colleague of mine from Canada. And uh, it just went on and on and on. And there was a lot of opposition to it. Um, but it did eventually pass in 2019. Um, and so the current generation of dolphins and whales in Canada, which are at Marine Land, Ontario, will be the last in Canada um, to be in, a, in an entertainment park. So, you know, when you look at this and you analyze what happened and why did this bill finally get passed, um, there's a lot of things, a lot of factors that come into play. What made the difference? Um, because there were times when we thought it was over and um, it kind of got resurrected again. So lots of things made a difference. Progressive government officials, a very well thought out strategy going ahead, very well established legislative framework that wasn't based upon anything that would require, you know, a complete overhaul of Canadian society. Um, there were a lot of high profile champions in parliament, uh, senators, there was indigenous leadership, which was extremely important to this case, and a very vigorous and focused social media and grassroots messaging campaign. But one of the uh, factors that made a big difference, but not the only difference, was scientific testimony, the testimony of scientists for, in support of this bill, because they didn't really have any scientists on the other side. So it's, it's really clear that scientists won the case at committee based upon evidence refuting the scientific arguments from Vancouver. Marineland didn't make any scientific arguments because they don't do any science, but um, the Vancouver Aquarium uh, was making arguments about how, you know, if, if they can't have dolphins and whales in captivity, that'll affect the research, and if the research shuts down, they can't do conservation. So it's the same kind of claim that they make over and over again. And one of the things I did in my testimony was uh, refute that. And I refuted it uh, empirically by just showing that uh, very little relevant work had gone on in Vancouver Aquarium. And even a smaller percentage of that actually gets into the literature. And even a smaller percentage of that actually is relevant to conservation. So by looking at the, the quantity of the work they do, as well as the quality, I was able to show that that claim is really not uh, one that's well supported. Um, you can really say that a um, whole science team was created for this purpose. And it was critically important in making our case that even though the case was based upon science driven by ethics that the language used was evidential and um, the language of biology uh, so that the weight of science can be brought to bear on these arguments and myself and many others gave scientific testimony on cetacean intelligence emotions, family and social life, traveling and diving, their evolution, 
and refuted claims of education and conservation by the Vancouver Aquarium. The important point here is that when you make an argument that's based upon something that is uh, just a, a thought or a feeling, um, it can be dismissed, but science cannot be dismissed. What it has to be is refuted. And so if you make a claim based upon empirical evidence, it is just not appropriate to just have it dismissed. It has to actually be refuted by actual evidence on the other side. And that, and that gives it a certain power that other forms of argumentation don't have. Now, it's really important to think about the fact that, you know, there are a lot of factors that go into a success story in terms of a policy uh, or a legal decision. And I would say that science is not always sufficient to carry the day, but it is certainly necessary. It is certainly necessary. Um, it's kind of interesting when you think about it. So this is Senator Daniel Christmas. Um, and he is a Senator in Nova Scotia and he testified uh, in uh, support of S203. And he's an indigenous leader, a brilliant man. And this is what he said at one of his, when he stood up, he said, there's no testimony here from the people who are affected most by the vote. In other words, here we are a bunch of humans sitting around, arguing, having meetings, but we're human, we're not whale. And he said, the people who actually, whose lives will actually be affected by this are the whales. And he said, a lot of the argument talked about the human need to research the species. So the Vancouver Aquarium putting forth this idea, we need to keep beluga whales and so forth because we have to research them. And then he said, but I wish it were possible to get the testimony of a cetacean. If I had the opportunity to ask a beluga whale, I believe I would ask them, what is best for your family? And it brings up this really important issue in animal law. Who will speak for the animals? And I think that scientists are in a unique position to speak for the animals because they spend their lives studying the animals and knowing the animals. So they can address the question of who are you? Now, they can't know what's in the minds of other animals completely, but they are uniquely positioned to be able to say, a chimpanzee, a dolphin, a giraffe, I know what they're like. I know what they need and who they are. And that has got to be the basis for all animal law and policy. The problem is that scientists in general have been quite reluctant to engage with ethicists and legal advocates for animals. I was at Emory University for 20 years in a neuroscience program, and I witnessed this firsthand. Um, it's also the case that uh, scientists are, are more apt to engage on animal welfare than animal rights. So the scientific community in general is really skittish about engaging in animal advocacy, um, not so much in advocacy for human rights, but for animals, uh, they see this as something very different. And that's something that we have to overcome. And there's a number of reasons for this. First, scientists view their work as objective and other fields like advocacy is more subjective and emotional. And they usually use that kind of as a put down, you know, well, you're just making an emotional argument or a moral argument, but what I do is, is objective. And, you know, the point about that is, yeah, a scientific study needs to be objective, well controlled um, and all of that good stuff. But there is nothing about that says that your findings cannot be used 
uh, to, to promote ethical or moral uh, uh, issues. Um, but a lot of scientists are just really scared of getting involved with animal law and any kind of animal advocacy for that reason, because they'll be seen as not objective, even though that may not be a fair, a fair critique. They also don't feel qualified to engage with non-scientific fields. They just feel like, well, I don't, I just do my studies. I don't know what it animal law is or or philosophy so what do i have to offer it's also true that the contingencies of success in academic science are not friendly to going beyond one studies and publishing papers uh, if you are um, an academic scientist and you get into the, the realm of advocacy of any kind um, even if you get into the realm of public education, that's you tend to be looked down upon for that um, because you're supposed to be a good scientist and publish your papers and get grants and that's it and you sh and keep quiet. Um, and of course, you know that that is a tremendous problem and it gets passed on to their students and the next generation. Um, it's also the case, and I saw this uh, at Emory, scientists in academia enculturate the idea of hardening towards animals in their students because they see this as the only way to continue their work. So if you're a scientist and you have a lab filled with other animals, rats, monkeys, and you depend upon students coming through your lab to help you do your work, you're going to be invested in making sure that those students do the work and uh, do not um, and become hardened to the realities of some of the work that they have to do, which is often invasive and terminal. Um, so there's a real re and I and I saw in my own uh, career experiences students who were sensitive to what was going on in the lab with scientists punished for it and get out of the field, which is a really, really unfortunate consequence and why I started the Camilla Center. And this kind of culture is reinforced in institutionally and intergenerationally. And now on the, at the same time, if you're a law student in animal law, you don't get any training in scientific methodology, findings, or even the nuances in politics and sociology of science. But yet, you have to use science and scientific findings in your own work. So we have two groups here who, who one has a lot of information, but they're reluctant to get involved in advocacy, even legal advocacy. And then we have animal advocates, legal advocates, who need that information from the scientists. And, and these have to be brought together. So there is currently an increasing need to bring science and law together more extensively, more expediently, and more deeply. And that is why uh, a law, uh, animal law attorney, Kathy Hessler and I started the Animal Law and Science Project um, at the George Washington University. Um, and I wanna say that um, a lot of our beginning work uh, was supported uh, by the Brooks Institute. Um, so what are we doing at GW? Well, we're trying to formalize this bringing together the synergy between animal law and animal science. Um, we just launched a few months ago, and we are engaged in the bringing together of animal law scholars and practitioners, policymakers, and experts in the natural and social sciences to address the questions, what can science do for animal law? So, you know, having testified in so many cases, having worked with the Non-Human Rights Project, I see the power of science in animal law. And what I want to know is what, how do we maximize that? 
what do animal lawyers and policymakers and advocates need from scientists in order to do their work best? And so that's, that's the core issue that we are trying to address in a more formal way uh, through this Animal Law and Science Project. What would a legal system properly informed by science and their harms look like? This is another important question. And so Kathy and I have set about to create pathways of collaboration across disciplines that will empower animal protection in litigation and legislation and policy creation and education. And all of this is part of the Animal Legal Education Initiative at GW Law. So what are we gonna be doing? We're gonna be offering programs and resources that bring together uh, through interaction, science, legal scholarship, and legal advocacy. And uh, we're gonna be doing that in a number of ways. We're gonna be starting off in several ways. We are working on developing a directory of scientific experts who are eager to contribute to animal advocacy. So currently that's a short list, but we wanna make it longer. So this is about going to colleagues and scientists and say, would you be willing to lend your support and your expert advice to a lawyer who is uh, developing a case for an animal or policies or legislation and sort of get them on, on um, record uh, so that lawyers can go to this directory and say, okay, these people, these scientists have said that they're willing and I don't have to go crazy looking for somebody. Um, it's right there. We are going to increase the presence of science and animal law at conferences. And what does that mean? It means going to science conferences and adding animal law in and going to animal law conferences and adding science in. So kind of stretching those boundaries with our presence. Um, and we plan to offer advanced courses and develop curricula. And the, the whole thing is that through this work, we hope to increase awareness and foster greater discussion of the ways animal law and science can empower each other and work towards a goal. And so right now um, we are preparing a series of webinars to sort of launch um, what we're doing. We have um, uh, a number of things that we're doing, but this is the one that is going to be rolled out to really introduce everyone to this program. And this is going to happen in the summer, um, early summer. Um, we have a series of animal law and science live webinars. So we are offering these webinars that are at the intersection of the different areas of science and law that need to come together. It is the goal is to introduce lawyers to science and scientists to lawyers. And it will feature experts from both the scientific and animal law communities. And we hope to build on these as beginning conversations um, to develop uh, course curricula and, and other kinds of materials. So we're, we're going to offer three webinars, separate times, and they'll be live. Um, and the one is going to be Animal Law 101 for scientists. So what, as a scientist, do you need to know about animal law and legal advocacy in order to feel comfortable supporting it, to get engaged in it, to understand that you do have something to offer? And what are all the ways you can do that? And so we will discuss how scientists can help strengthen animal legal efforts. And hopefully this will be the beginning of a conversation between scientists and lawyers and legal practitioners in order to develop more seamless communication. One of the things is that scientists and lawyers have different language and terms for different things sometimes. So part of this is learning what we mean when we speak to each other. And 
the the real i mean the big goal here is to break down that reluctance that many scientists have for getting involved in animal advocacy because if you really take a look at the population of scientists in the animal field globally and how many actually in in get involved and interface with animal advocacy, legal and otherwise, it's a minute portion. And yet there is so much evidence out there. There's so much expertise that lawyers can use. We're going to have another one on natural science 101 for animal attorneys. In other words, this is going to be a way to introduce students and practitioners in animal law to science to what is it, what is it not? Um, and what are the different uh, uh, areas in science that you can probe to, to get your work done? Veterinary science, evolution, comparative psychology, biology, ethology. And it will serve as an introduction to the basic terms and concepts and resources used in the natural sciences. And, it, it, you know, it's going to include um, one, of, one of the most important things, which is assessing evidence and the different levels of strength that different kinds of evidence have. Now, I know in the law, it, that doesn't always match what is considered strong evidence in science, but it's really important to know what is strong evidence in science, that, that there is a hierarchy. Of, of what is refutable and what's not. Um, critical thinking about scientific claims. Political landscape of the sciences. Boy, is, are sciences political. Um, and how to involve scientists early on in strategizing instead of just as an add-on is what do you know about this animal, who that animal is that can help us build a stronger case right from the beginning. And again, we will be followed by the development of an expert bank of scientists who agree to be advisors, affiants, witnesses, et cetera. And then the third one is very interesting because it's all about us. Uh, it's not about the animals because unfortunately, human psychology is a big factor here, uh, good and bad. Um, so this is Social Science 101 for animal attorneys. And this is all about how human psychology impacts how we think about other animals, how we strategize about other animals, how judges think about other animals, what are our implicit biases, what is human exceptionalism, what is the kind of language that triggers certain uh, biases and prejudices in our species about other animals, decision making. How do people make decisions? There's a whole social science uh, field out there that can that can inform lawyers about how people actually make decisions. And what I'd like what I like to say is um, there's a whole literature out there on people who you can get someone to say a red dot is a green dot. Um, and there are certain conditions under which you can do that. And animal lawyers should know about that. Of course, it's, it's not about anything other than the fact that you want to be aware of the social psychological dynamics that go on. Prejudices, groupthink, attitude change, comparison judgments, etc. And this, this, um, will equip animal attorneys, attorneys with what they need to consider when dealing with humans, both in and out of the courtroom. How do judges make decisions? For instance, is going into a court and saying an, a chimpanzee is a person, a legal person, is that the most, uh, is that the best way to go in? And things of that nature because the judge is a human being who has comes in with his or her own biases. What are those triggers and what concepts are difficult for people to accept? So what we plan for the next few months are the listserv, which we're getting up and going, webinars. We're gonna have a website up by the fall and presence at conferences.
So I want to thank you. Um, please feel free to contact me uh, if you have any questions above and beyond what we're doing today. And I'm more than happy uh, to, to discuss matters with you. So I'm going to stop share here and um, uh, just turn things over to our Q&A.